Hello and welcome back to the Pitch Side Podcast. I'm your host, the HOD of the PSP. Like, share, comment on the YouTube version of this podcast, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, enable notifications to receive all the updates from all the podcast episodes and, of course, all the content on the channel. Listen to the podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any other platform. And, of course, follow us on social media, site PSP on Twitter, Pitch Side Pod on Instagram. Join us for this episode 134, the magazine episode of the podcast, and you're welcome. Now let's kick things off by some Friday night football. A couple of games took place, of course, across um, Europe. Arsenal, Everton in the Premier League. And as I talked about yesterday in the episode in the weekend preview, check it out if you want to. Um, Everton were the better side, like I talked about it. I mean, Arsenal had priorities now in the Europa League, as I mentioned. The Premier League isn't exactly um, you know, the priority for Mikel Arteta, but still... Um, it, this was not an excuse to lose a game like that against uh, Everton. Arsenal were the better side, quote-unquote, really, because they missed a lot of chances. They had a lot of opportunities in the second half in particular to really um, you know, score. And they actually scored, but the uh, goal was denied for Nicolas Pepe. And, you know, um, I mean... It's, it's definitely something that Arsenal would regret, really, losing like that to Everton. Um, definitely the goal itself was... You know, pretty weird um, from Everton. It was it counts as an own goal for Brent Leno because he sort of bottled doodling with the ball. It was an absolute shambles of a you know trying to save the ball for Brent Leno. Uh, but I think the whole goal was stupid. Like from the way the defense was set up, the Arsenal defense was set up to the way that you know Richarlison took the defender behind him and just turned around him at ease. Um, you know, on a long ball, but Richardson is a strong player, we all know that. I mean, to the way he decided to take the shot in the very, very, the tightest of angles, and, you know, he was lucky, he was lucky, and um, he he scored it, or at least Bernd Leno scored it for him, and Everton managed to defend really well afterwards. I think, um, you know, Everton, again, as I mentioned yesterday, they are a really better side than Arsenal at the moment. And with the priorities of Arsenal being stretched between the Europa League and the Premier League, it doesn't really look like a good time for Arsenal to be playing Everton. Um, important three points for the Toffees. They get them, um, you know, they don't move up the table really, but they get closer and they keep closer and they keep closing down on the um, on the Champions League places, on the Europa League places. Um, at the very least, if they are able to. Um, elsewhere in the Bundesliga and in a pure relegation fight, Augsburg lost to Köln 3 2 uh, at home. Of course, Köln completely routed them at home. The important thing in this game for me is that Elias Schrieb, the Tunisian player, got an assist on the day. Beautiful assist, by the way, for the first goal for Andre Duda. Florian Kainz scored the second, and Duda was back with the third. Augsburg had two consolation goals in the second half, but that didn't help them to rejuvenate or to get anything out of this game. I mean, they're not concerned really with relegation. I mean, although they're still involved um, in, in the fight, it's quite a fight really for the relegation. Um, you know, there are at least like five teams involved that could escape that uh, fate, of course, or six teams involved that could escape that fate. Augsburg, Mainz, Werder Bremen, Armenia, Bellefield, Köln, and Hertha Berlin. Of course, Hertha Berlin, as we mentioned yesterday, they have three games cancelled because of the COVID anti break. So, you expect if they win their games, um, you know, relatively qu- against, you know, um, minnows of an opponent's Freiburg and Armenia Bellafield and all of that. So you expect them to really win their games and move up the table and finish in a decent place. But hopefully for Köln, because just because they are Schiri plays there, I hope that Köln finishes above relegation or at least play the playoff and, and come back to the, uh, the Bundesliga because I want him to play in a bigger side. I want him to play in a bigger club than Cullen. He deserves it. He's a good player. He's the best player in Cullen. And I think he completely and thoroughly deserves it. Let's move on. And football still carries on despite the Super League uh, depression that took over the world in the last week or so. And we have proper football to take care of as on Sunday Manchester City face Tottenham. In the Carabao Cup final. Um, I think it's more important for Tottenham really. To get them a trophy this season. After all the whole you know. Um, the whole mess with Mourinho really. Um, this season has been. The season has been tremendous. Um, you know for Man City. But bad for Tottenham. on Almost on every single level. Since the turn of the year at the very least. Uh, because before the turn of the year. They were at the top of the table at a certain point. 
playing for Champions League and, you know, we're talking about can Mourinho get them the title? Can Mourinho win them the title with such football? Obviously he didn't. He was sacked. And now Ryan Mason's taken over momentarily at the very least until the next coach comes. The rumours are Julian Nagelsmann is going to be the next coach. And I'm certainly agreeing with most opinions that says he's going to be lowering himself to um, to take the Tottenham job. The guy have an opportunity to, to, to take silverware this season with the uh, DFB Pokal in Germany. And also have the opportunity to join Bayern next season if he wants to really make an upgrade in his managerial career. Staying at Leipzig would be better for him than being the next coach for Tottenham, really. And we're going to be talking about that in different um, times. We're going to be talking about that probably next week on the magazine episode. Why should he, shouldn't he uh, take the Tottenham job? But back to the final. Tottenham this season have been in a turbulent um, term, you know, with the with the whole Mourinho thing. Um, you know, he's been he's been absolutely horrendous this season. I mean, normally that you know these kind of problems that Tottenham have creep up in the third season with Mourinho, but this, I mean, but it was too early. It was uh, postponed or or it was you know foreshadowed uh, by Mourinho really. This uh, season, I mean, Tottenham are a mess, particularly since the turn of the year. They are a real, real mess. You know, the results are not exactly good. Um, you know, not, um, you know, being eliminated in that way from the Europa League against Dinamo Zagreb, being 2 0 up at home and then 3 0 down, going away to lose 3 0 down in that fashion is quite embarrassing. And I think that was, I think, the straw that broke the camel's back for Tottenham's board with Jose Mourinho because. They have been having those results in the league. They have been losing in the league. They have been dropping points. They have been getting slipping and slipping away from the Champions League spots, from the top spots in the Premier League after once they were top of the table. I mean, we're talking about Tottenham potentially winning the league under Jose Mourinho with this defensive mentality. Obviously, they didn't. Mourinho was sacked. Ryan Mason took over. And he had a decent job in the first game, despite the fact that he was pretty nervy for a half or so. For 45 minutes or so, it was pretty nervy against Southampton. Then he managed to fix his mistakes and, you know, lead Tottenham to a good win um, to start. I mean, he's a really young coach. Like, we're talking 29 years old young coach. That is like some players on the pitch are really older than him. Gareth Bale is older than him on the pitch. So you look at it like Tottenham winning a trophy is possible. Certainly don't end as the favourites in this one against Man City in any in any way, shape or form. Even Man City put on their second squad or third squad, they're still uh, favourites over Tottenham. But we saw Man City have problems as of late. Like, this is the fact. If Tottenham had problems of the whole season, Man City probably are having problems at the worst time. Um, you know, coming to a stretch where they have a Champions League match against PSG, you cannot afford to have you cannot afford to have errors. You still have, you know, the Premier League. Yes, you're gonna be winning it. The quadruple is done and dusted after being eliminated from the FA Cup. But they still have three titles to play for. The Premier League again is done and dusted, so the Carabao Cup is I mean, 50-50, really. We could say 50-50, Man City could easily win it, easily ran through Tottenham and, you know, just beat them 3 or 4-0. But mostly it would be a pretty tight one because, you know, Tottenham are going to be surely being pretty conservative. The Mourinho spirit might be still there, just about, to play a defensive game against Man City, to just try and, um, you know, counter-attack them. Because if Tottenham open up, City are going to just, you know, just going to demolish them. Um, in, in, in with the quality that they have over them, but definitely we will try and see what Tottenham are going to bring to the table. Are they going to be conservative? Are they going to be open up the game? Again, problems creeping up in Man City as of late. Defensively, they haven't been as solid as they were for the most season. So it probably should be a um, you know fascinating tactical battle to watch. I mean, how is going to be take on someone like Guardiola with his vast experience and and tactical maneuvering? How Ryan Mason is going to be dealing with that is going to be really tremendous to see. And um, we will we will talk about it, of course, when time is due on Monday after the final. Um, my predictions for the game, I would say City are going to be getting an easy win. I mean, 2-0 for City, I would say, is the minimum they would get. Tottenham, if they're not going to be playing conservative, they will open themselves up and City will carve them open. Maybe Tottenham will have a goal in them, so I would say 2-1 as a final prediction for the Carabao Cup final. 
Let's move on to other stories now. And um, over the course of the week, of course, it was announced that David Alaba is joining Real Madrid officially on a five-year deal until 2026. Um, I think this was big news. I think as far as um, as far as David Alaba is concerned, as far as Real Madrid um, are concerned, finding you know finally uh, finalizing the deal. I talked about it long ago that, you know, Real Madrid were the only option realistically to take him. Um, there wasn't exactly a lot of offers. Uh, there were a lot of offers from other sides, but nothing was realistic um, from any of them. I thought Real Madrid was the only option and probably the only upgrade that David Alba could take in his career other than, you know, a team like, I don't know, Boston or Real Madrid, probably the only upgrade, maybe financially at the very least, that David Alba would take. And David Alaba moving out of Bayern Munich is a pretty big deal. The guy has been in the in the Bayern Academy, um, and then he promoted to the you know the second team, the senior team, and he spent give or take 12, 13 years in the Bayern Munich sort of entourage um, environment, if we say, between the second team, between academy, and between the first team. He wasn't featured a lot for the first two seasons. Um, you know, he was he was a backup to to Diego Contento, and Diego Contento like wasn't that bad, but wasn't also great left back. Uh, I mean, he's not someone who would you remember as one of the greatest left backs in Bayern or anything like that. Not something like you know Vicente Lazarizu or Willy Sagnol or of that. Nobody's going to remember him in the same vein. David Alaba, though, give or take a proper decade in the senior team, won everything there is to win. Two Champions League, multiple Bundesliga titles, multiple cup titles, and featuring, you know, for a good number of, of matches for the team. He's featured like for, uh, by the end of the season, it will be 430 games for David Alaba with Juan Munich. And that is quite the number um, for, for David Alaba. And yes, he was, you know, riddled by injuries for the last couple of seasons. And, and actually, the for last season and before that, that's why they brought Davis into the dance because David Alaba was, was injured for most of the time. So definitely, it was a situation. I mean, I mean, it was it is it's bittersweet. It's bittersweet. It feels bittersweet to see someone like David Alaba, one of the best left backs in the world. I don't care what anybody says. He's one of the best left backs in the world. Period. For the last eight years or nine years, or so. Leaving Bayern Munich in this way. And I mean, obviously, there was the, the whole problem with him extending his contract. He refused to extend his contract. Bayern Munich gave him an offer, gave him a deadline. He didn't take it. And he chose uh, Real Madrid. He chose Real Madrid. And he's free in that. And again, it doesn't get much upgraded in football than going to Real Madrid. From Bayern Munich, that is. So, I mean, good luck for him. Um, thanks for his service for the club, for Bayern Munich. As a supporter, I'm saying this, for the last decade or so, um, he's, he knows he's been tremendous. He's been a leader. He transitioned into a centre-half pretty well. So he's, he's pretty versatile. Real Madrid could use him in both positions. He could cover up for left-back. He could be a centre-half. And that is, I mean, that means one thing. That means that... Real Madrid are going to be letting Ramos go, or Ramos is leaving Real Madrid at the end of the season, because there's no way that Alaba goes there with Ramos still a valid and active player in the, in the Real Madrid squad, because there's no one getting over Ramos at the moment in that Real Madrid squad. So, David Alaba going there as a placement might be the best course of action for Real Madrid, for him, and for everyone involved. As for Bayern, Upa Meccano, I think, who's come right in, Lucas Hernandez might get a little bit more time with the potential of uh, Boating leaving, with the potential of Nicolas Sule leaving as well. There's suggestions that he might go to Chelsea. Jérôme Boating might leave as well. So that's going to be quite a heavy loss for Bayern, losing three centre-halves at one season, um, you know, as far as Bayern are concerned. But again, they're going to replace him with Bamecano. They need some makeshift defending for the first couple of weeks. Um, certainly Bayern need to go to the market, really. They need to buy a right back, I think. They need to buy another centre-half. Uh, a couple of bodies in the midfield. A couple of bodies maybe in the attack. A replacement striker, really. Although, she promoting has his contract extended for another year. Reportedly, so it will not be a big problem there. So, that is what I want to say. Um, thanks for David Alba for all of his service. I really wish him 
well in his endeavours at Bayern at Real Madrid, um, and hopefully Bayern will not meet Real Madrid in the next five years while David Alaba is there. And the thing is, he's, he's going to be spending his prime years at, at Real Madrid. He's turning 28. He's turning 29 soon, sorry. He's going to be spending, what, the prime of the three, four years as, you know, centre-halves are concerned with uh, Real Madrid. That might be good for him. It is good for him. Financially, it's going to be very lucrative for him. And, you know, uh, hopefully he, he he really does good. He really comes ahead good um, at Real Madrid. And he becomes a really, really good, um, you know, helps them there, locally at least. Again, I don't want to see him facing Bayern in the Champions League. That would be awkward. Um, and, and that's it. Um, it's a good deal for David Alaba, a good deal for Real Madrid, a good deal maybe for Bayern to just, you know, leave some space for Lucas Hernandez to start because I want him to start. And uh, and that's about it. Elsewhere in the world, though, um, and about elsewhere in the world, I mean in Britain, suggestions are that after the failed European Super League, there's a proposal for a British Super League. How this British Super League is going to be working, according to all reports, is that Celtic and Rangers are going to be joining the Premier League. There's just like just a, a whole lot host of, of problems really in this in this one. I mean, straight out of the bat, come on guys. I mean, seriously, we just had to get past a European Super League that almost killed football if it happened. And now you're going to be talking about, you know, um, a, a British Super League. I mean, I mean, it's it's ridiculous really. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous idea and definitely an idea that is going to be destroying Scottish football in its own right. So the proposal, I mean, is yet to be f- fully fleshed. There's no real um, full proposal or full explanation what the project is going to be looking like. But the rumour is a short-term expansion um, with, you know, um, with Rangers and Celtic joining, while other reports suggest that a league should be condensed down to 18 clubs between Scottish clubs and Premier League clubs it's claimed that of course the discussion are ongoing that you know uh, there's an end of a season playoff uh, similar to the um, system used in the championship league one league two and all of that so this reform should get a shareholders vote if it want to get passed by the premier league it should get the shareholders vote currently the 20 clubs make up the shareholders would need the support of at least 14 clubs in order to pass this reform but it's claimed i think the backing of UEFA, FIFA and government is there, while um, you know Celtic and Rangers, sh- rivals in the Scottish Premier League, are not exactly keen on this. Um, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe it would be happy because it would end their dominance of the Scottish League and would give them, you know, sort of a, a space to breathe, really, and to win some leagues, the likes of St. Mirren and Hibernian and, 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 uh, and Hart Knox and all of that, and Motherwell, and those other teams. But... As far as the idea is concerned, I mean, Celtic and Rangers are kings in Scotland. And the whole Scottish games, um, the whole Scottish league, really, the whole teams, they wait for those fixtures with Celtic and Rangers to play with them. I mean, it's the same vibe as a Super League, realistically speaking. It's the same vibe as a Super League as the European Super League, only this time with the British Super League. At least there's relegation in it. At least uh, the proposal is there is idea that another other Scottish teams aside from Celtic and Rangers would play in the EFL pyramid, like the Championship and League One and all of that, and there will be some mix up. But the idea as a whole, I mean, certainly, I mean, it could work. It really could work. We saw the uh, we saw Netherlands, we saw Luxembourg and Belgium creating something similar in in the Benelux League and all of that. But definitely. A British Super League is is going to be. I mean, it's going to be helpful for Celtic and Rangers. Might get them a little bit more money uh, from the games that they would uh, they would play. But as a whole, realistically speaking, it wouldn't help the Scottish Premier League because those Scottish uh, footballers and players in those teams aspire to play Rangers and Celtics. They want to play those games against the old firm sides, and they want to have the emotion of playing against them in the Scottish League because they are the two biggest there. So that is quite... I mean, it's quite the pulverising idea. We'll still have more of that if it develops, of course, over the next couple of weeks, and we'll see how things are going to be planning out. But 
in my opinion, it's just going to be as failing of an idea as the Super League, as the European Super League, if it is not done correctly and it doesn't really take into consideration everyone involved in the pyramid, the Scottish clubs, the EFL clubs and all of that. Finishing off, and of course, the uh, repercussions and the reverberations from the European Super League are still felt in the world of football. It was a turbulent week. Um, certainly, the first three days of it were pretty rough to take for the world of football. We didn't believe what was happening. The amount of influx of news that was going out there, and I mean, personally speaking, the amount of videos I watched about the European Super League, the amount of news reports, the amount of shows that I watched talking about the Super League, um, and the interviews, I mean... I mean, I watched YouTube channels and TV channels that I wasn't even interested in watching just because I, w I wanted to know about the Super League and more about the fallout from the Super League and what's going to be happening. But now I think that things, quote-unquote, have calmed down. Uh, the storm has really calmed down, um, you know, at least the initial, um, the initial sort of, you know, initial sort of blow from the Super League has been died down in the last couple of days. We can really talk about the fallout. We could really sit back now and talk with a little bit of, uh, you know, of comfort about whether this Super League idea is dead and buried now in the water as it is, or will it make a comeback in the future? Now, the obvious answer is, with the current form, with the current format of it, with the current way that things are planned out, the 12 uh, first teams, and then you have the 15, and then the sort of, um, you know, the 15 teams choose the next five to finish the league and all of that, and the no relegation system, there's no way. There's simply no way that the, the Super League is going to be going like that. But, it's, but also, you have the other side of the coin. You have the fact that there is the new Champions League former that just was approved yesterday. I mean, it, it's a problem in its own right because it created congestions of fixture as well. I mean, if the season, if this season and last season were congested because of COVID, the next seasons, starting with the 2024 season where the, the new format is going to be kicking off, are going to be naturally congested because of that. And you cannot play what? Um, you cannot play, you know, uh, nine fixtures in the Champions League or extra you know, the extra 100 matches or something like that are not going to be played when your teams have 38 matches to play in their own leagues. So there's solutions are the, um, you know, the, the calendar should be either extended, which, I mean, Pep Guardiola jokingly said, but, I mean, I don't know if that's possible or not, extending the calendar of the season, that is, or, I mean, shrink down the size of the, uh, of the leagues, follow maybe the Bundesliga model, play 18 teams, I mean, even 16, I mean, try and give, you know, the, uh, try and give the, the, the leagues their sort of breathing space. The players need some breathing space. They don't need the, ex, you know, the, uh, the sort of, you know, very, um, you know, very hectic schedule of international breaks and cup games and Premier League games. Get rid of the Carabao Cup, for example, in the Premier League. Get rid of the, um, you know, uh, of, of some League Cups where League Cups are unnecessary. For France, France, they have three Cups. So I don't think, I mean, I don't think the, if, if the European Super League didn't make it, the new Champions League format might, surpri might surprisingly replace this Super League in disguise, might become the Super League because of the amount of matches going to be played and because of the amount of exhaustion for those big teams playing in those competitions and playing in the Champions League. Now, back to the European Super League, really, because I, I feel like I drifted a lot of the subject. In the current form, it is not coming back. Just forget about it. Andrea Agnelli, one of the most ambitious men about the project, admitted defeat, mostly, and said that, you know, the project in its current form cannot make a comeback. Let's just think about it again. Obviously, maybe the most damaged man of all of this, PR-wise at least, was Florentino Perez, who went on two separate interviews saying stupid things. Or, honestly, saying stupid things like that the 16, 24 old, uh, 24 year old generation doesn't follow football, doesn't have an attention span football. La Liga came out with the, with the analytics proving him wrong. He said that you know uh, the teams uh, forced are forced to pay a fee for signing a binding contract with him and with the Real Madrid as the head of the Super League to pay around 350 million euros, something like that. 
and you know most teams came out with contracts proving that this is wrong AC Milan have a clause in the contract that they can't do this without UEFA's approval and and why they were there in the first place he said a bunch of gibberish in his first and second interview he said a lot of a lot of bad things I mean he made himself look so stupid for a president that was so successful at Real Madrid and is considered as one of the smartest men in football, he certainly made himself look so stupid on TV. He made the, he, he embarrassed himself, let's put it this way. He embarrassed himself on live TV, he embarrassed himself on interviews, he really made a joke of himself. A president of a club such as Real Madrid making a fool of himself on TV like that is quite ridiculous. So, the next question will be, Will it make a comeback? Yes and no. Yes, because, um, I mean, they might be too greedy in the next, what, 10, 20, 25 years, maybe, uh, about the new Champions League format kicking in, and they will try maybe and see out how this Champions League format is going to give them more money, and if they're not satisfied with that, expect them in the next decade or so to maybe reshuffle the deck and try and re rebirth this idea once more and try to reshape it and then put it out with a better PR, a better strategy, a better sort of planning, better marketing, um, you know, to sort of adapt to the uh, the audience and to also adhere to the fans, adhere to this category of 16 to 24 year olds that Florentino Perez insists they don't have a short, uh, they don't have a long attention span for football, which is wrong, completely wrong. Because we see it in the players that they play in those competitions from that generation of 16 to 24 year olds. There's a lot of them at the moment. And there's a lot of brilliant ones at the moment in the world. So Florentino Perez is completely off the mark with, with his comments. Um, I mean, in the end, I see, I can see this, I mean, I, can, I mean, it is dead with its current form, but I can see it being rejuvenated and resurrected in some certain form after reforms, after discussions were being had between those uh, founding clubs make a relegation system make a system that you know involves more teams that makes this super league something enticing to both the viewers who want to see the big games and also for the other viewers because there is two billion there's three billion football viewers around the world and all of them should be satisfied with what they see in this Super League. If you want to make more money, if you want to, make, if you want to have more popularity, if you want to have more reach, and if you want this league to be a true Super League and to be a replacement that doesn't hurt the Champions League. I mean, that, you know, with the natural course of things, the Champions League might go to an end uh, at a certain point. So if the Super League was to replace it, at least it should replace it with the right plan, the right mentality, and the right format um that's it for me for this episode i was a boy the hd of the psp like share comment on the youtube version of this and subscribe to the youtube channel enable notifications to receive all the updates from these episodes of the podcast listen to those on spotify google Podcasts, or any other platform and until the next time i'll be seeing you soon goodbye